It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Jim Dalrymple from The Loop is here, as well as Andy Anako and Renee Ritchie's triumphant return from CES. We'll talk about Apple at CES, their privacy play, and why health services might be the most important thing Apple's got up its sleeve. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 644, recorded Tuesday, January 15th, 2019. Shlomo, Guillermo, and Alyosha. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Grammarly. Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake free, clear, and effective. Start writing confidently by going to Grammarly.com slash MacBreak and get 20% off a Grammarly premium account today. And by LastPass. Make password management a priority in 2019. Secure every password-protected entry point to your business and reduce the threat of breach at LastPass.com slash twit. Oh, and we'll be at the LastPass cocktail party at RSA. Come by and see us. And by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com to find out which Atlassian tools are right for your team and give their products a try for free. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. Joining us from the loop, loopinsight.com, the famous, the world famous Jim Dalrymple. Hello, Jim. How you doing, Leo? I am great. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. I miss you. Yeah, looks like the beard's in fine fettle. Oh, uh, you know, it's it's going strong. <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. Great to have you. You were uh, your ears were probably burning because uh, I've been talking about uh, iTunes Match and the problems you had a couple of years back with uh, Apple's music matching and and so yeah. forth. It's all better now, right? Um. <laughs> pretty much okay there you go there okay, you have that, it that's, there's topic two today there's the view from the front <laughs> uh, also with us mr andrew Inotko of uh, wgbh in boston boston public radio nice to see you nice to see you in honor of uh, jim i did not shave today so i have don't have a beard you got a way to go I have, <laughs> I, I, I have i have solidarity like uh, chin stuff you got a way to go <laughs> Yeah, exactly. yeah, you got a month or two. At well, least. I got see, I got again be, between between this my my sideburns and Jim's everything else. We've got real like civil war, like northern general I'm, stuff. Going I'm the on only here. one in the panel without any facial hair. I feel really left out because Renee Ritchie's back. We missed you, Renee. And so oh, I missed you guys too. Yeah, I had to go. I, I had an unexpected CES experience. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> who it's like how did how did that lives. happen? My boss kept saying, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. You don't have to go. And then like two days before, he's like, oh, I remember when I said you don't have to go. You have to go. I was kind of wrong. You have, you to, have go. to go. Was it yeah. worth it? What was, uh, did Apple actually had a little bit of a presence at CES? Yeah, with all the, I mean, sure we're going to talk about it with all the AirPlay 2 and HomeKit and iTunes for Tizen. I mean, let that sink in for a moment. iTunes, iTunes for Tizen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, they were a big. They were the big talk of the show last year. There was a lot of condemnation for them not being there, not having any pre presence, letting Google Home and uh, Alexa steal the show. And this year, Samsung put out their announcement the Sunday before the show, and they got just a, a ton of attention for the rest of the week because it kept being like, and another TV set company, and another TV <laughs> set company. So and Apple they had, they did much better did, prepared. Apple did at first. We thought Apple's only presence would be that big billboard on the side of the Marriott. <laughs> yeah hotel there that, that said priceless that what happens on the yeah. iphone stays on the iphone uh yeah. a great lesson in snark according to cnet uh and that and the, of course the whole point of that is uh while everything else at ces is spying on you we're not yeah you like that jim i mean i did like that i thought that was that was a brilliant uh, uh marketing campaign going into ces considering you know the other companies that were going to be there yeah uh, particularly I mean, Google Assistant when, and Amazon's Echo, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when you when you think about it, um, what better way to to fight the competition than boost the thing that that you put out there the most, which is privacy for Apple, and the thing that other companies put out there the least. This Apple's. I was talking on uh, Friday with um, 
on triangulation with Shoshana Zoboff. She's written a new book called Surveillance Capitalism. She says, invented by Google, perfected by Facebook. But she gave Apple a pass. She said, and, and, and we, I asked her about this. She said, really, it's a big opportunity for Apple so that so if people want to use technology, because technology doesn't mean surveillance, but if they want to use technology without having the company collect data about them and then try to influence them with that data, uh, the Apple seems like they're well positioned to do that. That would be a real opportunity for them. And it seems like they, they know that. Can I give you a great example, Leo? Yeah. So like Apple, Apple also got their act together with HomeKit this year and they worked with a bunch of providers uh, to get really good products like door locks and doorbells and all these camera systems that also have options not to share your data with anybody. And that came into really good focus a couple of days in Ring. when Ring. first the information and then the intercept, yeah, broke that story about Ring. And that really, I know for a lot, especially a lot of people at the show, uh, that gave them sort of an instant different take on almost all of the, all of the gadgets that were putting all your stuff into these companies' hands all the time. And companies yeah. who didn't always know, like they were just a product name, you didn't necessarily know who owned them or where the data was. And I'll, I'll mention this story because Ring was is a long time, was a long time sponsor uh, yeah. of our shows. The Ring doorbell was uh, purchased by Amazon. Amazon says they're not doing this. Ring wasn't clear whether they'd done it in the past. A couple of years ago, I think it was, was it 2016, Ring wanted, apparently, according to the, this is the story from The Intercept, Sam Biddle, I don't completely trust. You said uh, you said the information also had this. I trust the information had it earlier in December, and they listed like they're very good at disclosing. And they said we have twenty four sources who said this. We have company documents. We have their PowerPoint presentations. Okay, that's we have their investor good. notes. So yeah. in order to get uh, <laughs> to get uh, face recognition into uh, their device, they and th this is not uh, an unusual practice. They needed it to be trained, actually object recognition uh, they needed to be trained and so they sent it to contractors in ukraine who would then circle that's a face that's a package that's a tree uh and and uh, according to the story they basically gave them access to an s3 bucket that had everybody's video from yeah. every ring device ostensibly for the training but it also meant that right. the, those those people without, could download it share it yeah um, with, with Without without due caution, without due without uh, due protection, it's this is how these things almost always happen. It's it's never it's never it's never that cavalier, but it's just as devastating. Where they say, "Oh, we're, we just need to train our system to learn about what a dog looks like," but it doesn't occur to them that maybe this should be this training should be happening inside a locked box with all yeah. kinds of controls over who gets access to this video and what they can do with it. But no, if, unless your company is really built with from the ground up with the idea that security and, and uh, privacy is one of our foundational and fundamental tenets this is the sort of thing that happens that's the difference between a company like apple and everybody else and then to a lesser extent a company like google and a company like facebook uh remember that the the old, <laughs> uh, 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 uprising from employees could not shut down the project to uh, create a a search engine for china uh, outrage from governments could not create create the uh, could not turn down that 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 project Pressure from uh, from uh, from uh, human rights people could not do that, but as soon as they violated internal uh, internal privacy uh, protocols, say that you should not be you did not come to a, come to our department for permission to scrape this data from this Google owned China launch page, you are getting shut down right now. You have no access to any of the data you need. So, it, but it's it's shocking though, isn't it? That the only thing that stops these things from happening is the goodwill or the good intentions or the good uh, dogma in, in Apple's case of a company that there are no in the United States there are just no protections whatsoever. All you got to do is say eh, sorry, and then maybe you have to and send a, some, send a nice note to the shareholders for this for the stock dive. But there's no consequences whatsoever, and that needs to change. And it's expedient, like it's never, it's almost never malicious. Sometimes it's almost never malicious, but it's just expediency. They wanted Careless. this done and they had yeah. tarot and, but they also had a database that had, that they could go find the email address and then put that email address in and watch that specific camera. And because there was no one supervising any of it, guess what they did? I mean, it just, it, it, it's just yeah, and, and trouble all the way to I, I still have a ring doorbell and I don't really much care if somebody looks at what's on outside my house. Uh, but I guess ring also, I didn't realize this had inside cameras. Yeah, it was the internal cameras too. And they said they were like, they, people were walking by with 
they were watching people kissing and having conversations. Yeah. And yeah, this is why I wonder when Apple is going to do their own like home security or home like home monitoring service. That's going to be a killer thing. If there's one thing that could get me to switch a certain platform to Apple, it would be if they would decide if I get the functionality uh, of uh, my Google backed. Uh, internal cameras, which are really useful for me because sometimes I just need to check what's going on outside. Or sometimes when I leave, I really do want to have a camera going on inside my office to make sure that nobody is stealing a $5,000 thing that's on loan to me that I'm going to have to pay for. But I, even with Google, a company that I trust with conditions, I don't, I keep that camera turned off when I'm, when I don't need a security thing. If Apple decided to do this, I mean, you guys are absolutely right. When it comes to privacy and security, this really is hardwired into the DNA of the company. And I, I would implicitly, instinctively trust that not only do they as a company, or, or are they as a company not going to abuse this data, but they're going to make sure that no one else can abuse it either. So this would be a huge opportunity for Apple. Neither Amazon nor Ring responded to the information's request, although uh, according to um, The Intercept, uh, a, a Ring spokesperson said it's not happening now, but he did not yeah, ask I got a, whether a it happened from in the them. past. Yeah. I, got a, I got a comment from, because uh, I put up a video about it. Not, I used those as examples for why we need both regulation about privacy for companies and also to, you know, protection from the government from these companies, but also protection from the government, you know, like basically a right for privacy. And I got a very polite two paragraph statement from them basically saying that they take privacy very, very seriously and they have strict yep. policies in place. But as min numerous people pointed out, this was all forward looking stuff. It didn't really address anything specific. Yeah. In the past, are are yeah. they changing the terms of service to say that now it is a, an explicit opt in to allow uh, the company access to data for training purposes, both humans and robots, or is it now simply well, you just this is one of the this is one of the things you you blow past when you're trying to get this thing yeah. installed. That's in the EULA. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Green. Well, I I think a lot of this stuff, not just from uh, from Ring, but for all of these companies that are looking at at. AI and machine learning and all of that they're 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 so focused on the technology they tend to forget about all of the privacy aspects of of what they're doing and I agree with with Rene a lot you know this isn't necessarily necessarily malicious but the end result is basically the same it's I don't think it's malicious but it is sloppy yeah. yeah, it's right. Exactly. It's the interests of a company superseding what the interests of the user are. Uh, and it's it's a complicated problem in uh, in medicine, too. The thing is, the more data that uh, that medical algorithms get access to, the better these things are going to be at uh, at uh, look at discovering diseases and discovering problems early on or correctly or, or reducing the cost and increasing the access of medicine. However, Privacy now, uh, medical medical information is one area in which we do have laws protecting uh, what act, what information can be sent elsewhere, and why and how consent has to be performed and uh, explicitly in order for this sort of happen. So it's odd that uh, it's it's a little bit it's it's odd that we are being protected very rightly uh, uh, our privacy for medical information, but this is also making uh, delaying the access to medical technology that could potentially save a lot of lives in the future. But that's you, also, you have to make a decision. It's also the same week that we found out three hundred bucks could get a bounty hunter or, yeah. or debt <laughs> collector access to your exact location from a from AT and T. I think all Sprint, the carriers, yeah. T Mobile, Verizon have done it before and got caught, so they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't available. Uh, Apple has has taken measures I think are, that are interesting. They've they, you're getting some sense they maybe care. They hired uh, this week um, a, a former Facebook employee, Sandy Paracalis, yeah. who had left Facebook in 2012 and has been very critical over its privacy policies since then. Uh, according to Financial Times, Paracolis will work in Apple's privacy team as a product manager, which is internal, an internal facing role designed to, and I love this, to, to ensure that new products and development protect users' privacy and minimize data collection. That's, a, I think, a strong signal they have, that Apple cares um, about this. 
they have a really cool approach. Like previously, there was like the performance team and the security team who could like literally take away your code and say, no, you're not shipping this until you fix it or we fix it or somebody fixes it. And they've added a privacy team. And the privacy team starts when you have like with Face ID, it starts when you have the idea for Face ID. It's not like develop Face ID, then we'll figure out how to make it private. <laughs> it's no, you can't do this until it's private. OK, you've done that. Now you can't do this until. And each step along the way, they have to figure out how to collect the minimum amount of data possible, how to encrypt it, how to anonymize it, how to get rid of it as fast as possible, and in the end, ultimately make a product that passes Apple's privacy criteria. And they're involved every step of the way along the process. And they have like these these teams, including individuals like him, who sit down with the engineers and with the the engineering managers and figure out how to do it. Tim yeah. Cook, in, their, uh, in his interview with Axios last November, said that privacy is a core value. If you look back over time, we were talking about privacy well before iPhone. So we've always believed that privacy was at the core of our civil liberties. It's not a matter of privacy versus profits or privacy versus technical innovation. That's a false choice. What we've done is your device has incredible intelligence about you, but I don't have to have all of that as a company. Now, okay, here's a tough question, though. Some say, yeah, Apple pays lip service to this. It's good marketing, but do they really do it? I think they do. Uh, they really do it because a lot of the the information that we uh, try and send to Apple, like through Siri, Siri could be a, a much more intuitive product <laughs> if Apple would collect. That's the proof. All, Siri sucks. All, all of that data. <laughs> do you think they would do that on purpose, Leo? <laughs> that's, that's, that should that should have been like the second billboard. If they had another wall billboard available for purchase, look how bad Siri is compared to everything else on the market. That means well, you can trust us. <laughs> I, I mean. Really, I mean, Siri can do things inside of of your your iPhone or or your iPad. But um, if Siri collected more data and looked ahead more, like some of the other products out there, then that's a good data you know, point. I agree. What yeah. about China, though? I mean, Apple has been very cooperative with the Chinese yeah. government. In fact, iCloud data in the China is stored on Chinese servers. So I asked about that um, because that, you know, I, I talk about this stuff quite a lot and I always want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. And it's hard for people outside China to think about life in China because for China, it's our citizens have data and we'll be damned if that data gets stored on American servers. That's data for Chinese Completely people. Completely reasonable, has by to the be way. Stored yeah. On Chinese. Yeah. And France wants this too. And, you know, the U.S. doesn't want U.S. telecommunications to go through Huawei but, infrastructure. But we know that either. China, the Chinese government has yeah. in the past, in the case of Yahoo, used information collected by tech companies to sure. so prosecute. Apple has and, the keys. Yeah, like there's no difference architecturally between how iCloud works in China and how iCloud works. So the in Chinese America. government doesn't have access to that data without no, some sort of legal No, the danger is process. it's so much closer that they they could force their way in and, and right. use legal compulsions that would take weeks or months to get done right. in the U.S. They can do them there, but if that happens, then I think Apple will have to make a, a bigger decision about China. But for now, yeah. it's really it's repatriation. It's it's still it's still problematic. This it's the only reason why while uh, I, the, uh, Apple is the the company you can trust the most in terms of taking security and privacy seriously. That's why I twitch a little when I see as big a flex as the statement that what happens on your phone on your iPhone stays on your iPhone, because I don't think that they can. I don't think they can. They have really earned the ability to be that. I don't want to use the word arrogant again about it. I'm looking for I'm looking for something two notches below arrogant Hockey. because 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 as they they have a similarity with Google and Facebook in that they know where their money is coming from and they're willing to flex on something that doesn't really affect their own bottom line at all. What if if one of the best things they could do to help user privacy is to say, well, guess what? We're not we're no longer going to be taking any money from Google to be uh, use Google as the default search engine. Our default search engine is going to be DuckDuckGo because this is that. because we 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 uh, we love the, their their privacy protections and also we know that the, re, the the one of the most helpful things we could possibly do for DuckDuckGo is to make it the default search engine for the most popular mobile platform uh, excuse me but one of the most po popular mobile platforms in the world but they don't do that and they could also make the, make the safari browser a lot the make more proactive in protecting people against trackers but they don't really do that either 
that's not that's not saying that they're they're hypocrites at all. But that's when you it's a difference between saying we are proud of our respect for the privacy of our users and saying a big billboard facing everybody at CES saying what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. Well, depends on what country you're in and depends on what you're doing with it. And we'll still let certain apps on the App Store that maybe are still going to yeah, tell you that they, it's it's I just thought that's I, one I, thing I Shoshana it's, said. It's, it's, I said, do you use a smartphone? She said, yeah, I use an iPhone, but I don't put any apps on it because because yeah. that is that is the case. If you put the Facebook app on an iPhone, right. What happens in your iPhone does not stay on your iPhone when it, with regards to the Facebook app, including yeah, location that, information, that, information that you allow Facebook to collect. The way that um, that users interact with with other companies or other apps, Apple can't control that. Yeah. I mean, and they're they're not um, a, a charity. They they do, you know, they they're out there to make some some money, but keep users' privacy. As um, you know, one of their their main objectives, well, and they can argue that it's a user's choice. I mean, I don't have Facebook right. on my iPhone. That's up yeah, to right. you. I, again, I'm not saying they're hypocrites. I'm not saying that they're in any way like a terrible at security and privacy. Again, they are the apps, not only the best, they are the standard, I think, that every all other companies should emulate. However, when they do something as explicit like that. I'm the I'm the jerk in the back of the room who coughs and raises his hand and saying, "Can you clarify your position on this?" I would I would love for I would love to hear Tim Cook at some point post a letter simply saying that there is a line that we're not willing to cross when it comes to helping governments do bad things to their own citizens. Like if there were, uh, the, the, like if uh, if they wanted, if if the, if the government of any country wanted to. Uh, wanted the iPhone to have a kill switch for certain types of conversation. Let's say they passed an actual law in the country saying that every phone in the in the country has to do all of its text messaging through the standardized text messaging app that we can actually take a look at if we need to. They can, and uh, we're not allowing. Uh, VPNs, which is something that's already happened in China, but we're also not allowing encrypted chat applications. I, w I would love Tim Cook to say our. Uh, we have a we have a duty to say that if a government crosses an ethical line in our estimation, we will simply turn our back on that market. We will not simply decide that a market is so valuable to us that we are willing to let the iPhone become a tool of oppression, which is very, very possible in so much of the world. We're talking so far slight, historically, Dave. We're talking slight Sorry. differences here. I mean, if I put a Google phone next to the iPhone, if that's the choice, well, it's clear this is more private. Maybe oh, it's absolutely. not perfect, but the iPhone's clearly more private than any there, Android. There's also uh, this, this, sort this, of this, a quasi line where they they like, for example, with they want to pref they prefer to stay engaged in everything. Apple always believes that engagement is the best way to elicit change. And if they pull out completely, then they no longer have an effective platform to which to promote the change that they want. So they'll do a certain amount. Like for example, they still want to provide backup services to Chinese customers because they believe they promised them that, and that's fail safe, not fail secure. And you can argue about which is better for which customer. But they believe that by pulling out completely from China, they'd no longer yep. be able to offer things like preserving your photos of your children and things like that. But they've also shown with San Bernardino that there is a line where they believe if it's not legal and it's not ethical, they will fight for it. We don't we don't know what will happen if they lose ever. Like we'll see what happens with Australia now with some of their laws yep. uh, or maybe in the EU when they pass their laws. But they've shown a willingness to at least engage in incredibly public fisticuffs yep. over things that they find and unethical. Let, and, let's, and let's point out the human rights groups have said exactly the same thing that if you, uh, mostly, mostly in terms of what's, what Google is trying it wants to do in China, but saying that although it's a complex issue, we do believe that it's better to give people access to tools that uh, may to tools that might improve their lives and hope that it doesn't get compromised and maybe pull them back later than to simply preemptively decide that no, we're just not going to participate whatsoever. I think so that's, FaceTime that's an was pulled point. in the Emirates when when they were having issues with it. They would rather not provide the service than provide it yeah. compromised. They just pulled the FaceTime app. You know, it's interesting because uh, in this, I learned a lot in uh, this book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. But she yeah. quotes uh, Larry Page and, Page and Sergey Brin in their early paper about Google in the late '90s, in which they said. We'll never do advertising because advertising ultimately, however much you try to isolate it, will impact the result of search. But what happened is the dot-com bust and their investors in 2000 and 2001 came to them and said, you guys have to do something to monetize. This is not tenable. 
And Google flipped and said, we're going to do advertising. Yeah. And in order to do advertising better, we're going to collect all of this data we have about, you know, people are, we, we have a browser. We, ha we know a lot about what people do, not just what they search for, but what they do. And we're going to, instead of throwing that away, we're going to start using that. Uh, initially, they used it for advertising. But then Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg left Google, went to Facebook. <laughs> Facebook realized, oh, this is more than just targeting ads. You can use this to uh, initially to predict behavior and ultimately to affect behavior. She yep. points out that Facebook in its, they call them the contagion studies. And you may remember a couple of these. One, uh, Facebook tried to influence your mood yeah. by changing what was in your news feed and proved it Make could be sad. done. Yeah. In fact, they, they gave a paper saying, look, we could do this. Yeah. And, and Facebook, at that yeah. point, now <laughs> it's not just the trade-off you're making is not just for better advertising, which to me is a worthwhile trade-off, but they're in fact able to influence you. And yep. that starts to get problematic. Obviously, I don't know how perfectly they'll it's, be able to do that. Uh, again, we, we need we we need some sort of legislative protections. One one company that never gets brought up in these conversations, and I think they're one of the most dangerous, potentially one of the most dangerous companies of all, is Amazon, because they the the, the whole benefit of, of collecting data for advertising purposes. If you want to sell how good your ad network is, is you tell the the tire company that no, not only are we going to give your ad and put your ad in front of a million people people that suit the, the people you're asking for, but here's our data on how many people actually uh, see one of these ads and then go through to an actual sale of that product. Amazon is the one company that can not only track what <laughs> they, they track everything. If you've been, if you were just had a casual interest in a folding bicycle, they can track all the searches you did within Amazon, all the different products you looked at, uh, if, uh track the level of your interest as it waxed and waned, track your, yeah. uh, interest in certain price levels and certain feature levels, compare that to the history of the things you've bought over the past 10 years, all the way down from chocolate chip morsels to, uh, to, to, to an iMac. And then basically tell you, no, we know we know that Andy Notko is going to be ripe to buy a folding bicycle on February 8th, 2019. And we're offering to the highest bidder someone uh, a, a series of ads that will target Andy for a folding bicycle. Uh, it's if if there's one company that is really ready to have the antitrust hammer brought down on them. I think that Amazon has to be one of those final two or three candidates in the pageant. That's part of the problem, though, is that you can have a private iPhone a private Apple stuff, but you're gonna, but you're gonna use it to, to buy stuff on Amazon. You're gonna use it yeah. to. to I'm gonna share email it. somebody using Gmail, and yeah. they'll have my email anyway. Yeah. So, so but I mean, Am Amazon is in a very unique position, though, and Andy's absolutely right uh, about uh, Amazon. But the way that the public looks at Amazon is for convenience yeah. and for shopping. So we're willing to go in there, uh, you know, with an Amazon Prime subscription, get to get free shipping. Um, and Amazon, you know, gives us all of this stuff, you know, music and video and all of that kind of stuff with, with Prime. But they're getting so much information from us because we continue to buy there yeah. all the time. <laughs> and and as a consumer, it's it's very easy. You can order off of Amazon anywhere, and you can basically order anything you want. I mean, I order firewood sticks from from Amazon. You know, yep. to 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 light fires. Really, with. you buy your firewood on Amazon? No, no. You know the little sticks. <laughs> oh yeah, the the, the fatwood. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The kindling. Yeah, uh, yeah. fatwood. I, I I order that off of Amazon now, just if bought, because if you bought a cord, deliver bought, a big box and it's done, you know. So you bought a cord of firewood on Amazon, then I'd be impressed. Yeah. <laughs> they have a lumberjack network, Leo. What are you they talking about? They come in their plaid jackets in the yeah. driveway. See, yeah, but, I mean, but Jim, we, Jim, we tend to trust ahead. Amazon as a brand, right. like we trust Apple as a brand. But the differences are remarkable in how they use our information. I just I think yeah. it's important, and I think we can do this. That we continue to tell Apple, because I don't think, I think most users probably don't, aren't really that aware of it and care that much. But I think it's important that we who do care really keep telling Apple, yes, this is good. Keep doing this. Yep. Keep, keep, keep your eye on the ball. Because at some point it may be that the investors or the shareholders say, you got to make more money, you know, as, as their revenue drops uh, on iPhones, you got to make more money. You should really start doing, you know, they tried iAds, remember? I mean, that would have had some sort of trade-off of privacy for advertising. Uh, that they don't move down that road. That they understand there's real value to them as a company to preserve yeah. privacy as their core value. 
as, as we said once or twice before, it's all about the transaction. Some people, I'm comfortable with the transaction I'm making with Google, given the quality of the apps and services and now the hardware that they give me. And I'd like to think that I'm aware of what I'm giving them in response. Some people are not comfortable with that transaction. That's perfectly fine. I'm not comfortable with the transaction I make with Facebook. So I limit my exposure to Facebook to the minimum thing possible, which means that I'll like log in and check like on, on the web app messenger saying, oh, wow. Do you remember that week that I was feeling really lonely because no one like wanted to invite me to Christmas parties? Here are like eight messages on messenger saying, yo, Andy, I'm having a Christmas party in two days. Why don't you come over? Like, <laughs> Oops. Okay, Where well, are you, Sorry. Andy? It's, it's, January, it's January 2nd and I, I don't have the messenger it. app on my, on my phone. So. Yeah. Andy, hey, blink twice if you need rescue. I've got a, <laughs> uh, a Facebook portal I'll be glad to send you, Andy, if you <laughs> want to really keep up with the friends. And So there is good news. A judge has now ruled, a uh, federal judge, district yeah. court judge, has now ruled that the feds, even with a warrant, cannot force you to unlock your phone with your finger or your face. This yep. is a huge, huge ruling, and I don't know... How, you know, how I'm not sure what will happen here. The order came from U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. They denied a search warrant for a property in Oakland. The warrant included all the phones, any phone on the premises, and the ability to unlock them with facial recognition, a fingerprint, or an iris. In the past, we've just kind of said off the cuff that courts seem to support the ability to use biometrics to unlock yeah. but not the use of passwords. Because it wasn't testimony. Passwords were testimony, but biometrics right. weren't. The judge, uh, and I think this really recognizes the significant role that a phone plays in your life. The judge, uh, Candace Westmore, ruled the request was overbroad because it wasn't limited to a particular person or a particular device. The judge said... The government does not have the right, even with a warrant, to force suspects to incriminate themselves by unlocking their devices with their biological features. This is a very uh, surprising and, I think, a big deal ruling. Yeah. It's a it's a foundational uh uh, it's a foundational thing. Again, do you have the ability to keep a secret from the government? This isn't the big rule that, uh, that I'm hoping to see in my lifetime, but it is a big deal to say that if you've encrypted a phone, if you've locked a phone, you can't be compelled to unlock it. The government can take the phone and try to unlock it themselves, but they can't compel you to unlock it. Uh, the next, If this holds, and remember, and this is certainly going to be challenged, the next step is to make sure that everybody, including the police, knows that, you can, that they have the right to say no i will not let you unlock my phone and that includes a cop taking your phone and then simply holding up to your face and hoping that something good happens uh that we have to make sure that everybody understands that this is one of your rights you don't have to give up a fingerprint uh or a face scan and but all, all the same if i'm ever in a, in a in a sketchy situation i might just power down my phone just It'd probably be case. prudent to use an alphanumeric passcode and, and you can just squeeze it now and, and it also doesn't doesn't affect right, border screens. crossings, which I think is a much bigger problem. Right. There is a broader uh, ability to search uh, as you cross yeah. into and out of a, a country. Um, judge, uh, of course, she's a magistrate judge, so she could be overruled by district court. It could be appealed farther. I don't know if it will be. She said, and I think this is really great, technology is outpacing the law and that fingerprints and face scan are not the same as physical evidence. That's that's what they've been considered up to now, Right like a fingerprint or a hair, yeah. when considered in a context where those body features would be used to unlock a phone. It's essentially yeah. a recognition the phone is something special, something different. Yeah. She said, if a person cannot be compelled to provide a passcode because it is testimonial communication, a person cannot be compelled to provide one's finger, thumb, iris, face, or other biometric feature to unlock that same device. That seems sensible. That seems sensible. It will yeah. be challenged, though. Maybe, maybe Absolutely. not in this case, but at some point, and... Of At course, some point it will. It's not. It's not law. It's a precedent. But uh, I don't know how strong and it is. I'm not. A it's lawyer. critically important though because you're like our phones are now 
basically indistinguishable from external storage. It's like a, a hard disk with a wire that we're hanging off of our heads instead of hanging off of a computer. And it's keeping track of all the things that we're no longer equipped as humans to keep track of. But eventually that's that link is going to break down between what's in our head and what's in our phone or what's in our devices. And these are right now maybe external cybernetics, but eventually they'll get more and more internalized and technology will progress to the point where they can start having a real good idea what's knocking around inside our brains. And if we're not really careful about privacy, you know, it sounds like one of those dystopian future movies, but it always happens one step at a time. We'll absolutely lose it. So I think we, we yeah. it's best for all of us if we start litigating this stuff as early in that process as possible. Yeah, it, the, and the law is hysterically funny and how a precedent can shape unpredictable results in the future that the whole basis of wiretapping without uh, consent of those uh, or in, in being informed uh, is based on telegraph <laughs> operators saying that well the thing is we often have to listen in on a telegraph signal to make sure the wires are running properly and on that basis the person who is sending a telegraph wire cannot assume that uh, assume that this communication is not being observed by someone else and therefore if we were to put a tap on a telegraph line uh, before it even gets to a station or to a, to someone who will turn into a printed message it's okay for us to do that because the person had no idea that they were sending something that was that was private uh, to say nothing of the transcription person, but that was the basis of saying that when we got telephones and then automated switching later on, even though we now have a system where no human uh, is required to ever uh, oversee that signal to make that connection happen, it's still a, a basic principle that if some, that if I'm calling someone on a on a, on a 4G network with a that is a fun, that is a secured ish signal i i have every expectation that this call is being listened into by a third party so that's why we have to really keep a very close eye on every one of these actions uh this just in Theresa may's brexit vote has failed 432 to 202 in the uk parliament oh, wow <laughs> that'll be interesting let's take a break and we're going to come back jim dalrymple is here from the loop loopinsight.com andy Anako. WGBH Boston, and, of course, Rene Ritchie, imore.com. All three of you are writers. I pride myself, I think, on my excellent education, my ability to write clearly. However, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write anymore these days without Grammarly You're looking over my shoulder. <laughs> I'm a blogger. What is You're that? a longtime blogger. I am a longtime blogger. 12 You're years. You're a thought influencer and and brand, brand leader. <laughs> it's it's not a, a teacher going, no, no, no. It is a very useful writing assistant that makes you look and sound smarter and avoid, <laughs> everybody makes mistakes, avoid mistakes that make you look dumber. Great time to get Grammarly right now, whether you're at school, a blogger, whether you're writing essays, for law, whether you're writing uh, job resumes, Grammarly is awesome. It, it helps you show your best self through your writing. It's on every pl platform. They have online uh, browser extensions. There's desktop editors. On uh, iOS, you get a mobile keyboard checker, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. Their free product does critical spelling and grammar, but I would recommend Grammarly Premium. Partly because of that great email I get every week that says, you use more words than 99% of other Grammarly users. <laughs> I like that. It looks out for spelling, grammar, plus advanced punctuation, structure, style within context. Voca yeah, it understands context. That's really important because your writing's different in a business proposal than it would be in a blog post, right? Conciseness, vocabulary suggestions. They even grade your readability. And that's really important, too. you got to know your audience and then make it something that your audience can understand. Accomplish all your goals with help from Grammarly. No more email typos on your phone. Close more deals at work with your emails. Polish your resumes and get that new job. There's nowhere Grammarly isn't a great help. It even <laughs> didn't do this to me. It did it to Lisa. She wrote an email. She's in a hurry. She writes sometimes her emails are very short and sweet and to the point. And Grammarly said, you might want to soften this up just a little bit. It sounds a little brusque. And she, she appreciated that. I think that's really great. Go to Grammarly.com slash MacBreak and get 20% off your Grammarly premium account today. G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y. Just remember, M-M-A, right? There's two A's in grammar. Gram <laughs> I know that because I used to spell it with an E. G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y.com slash MacBreak. 20% off your Grammarly premium account right now. 
Just try it. I think you'll really appreciate it. Grammarly.com slash Mac break. Uh, let's see. Interesting uh, note in uh, Jean-Louis Gasset's uh, Monday note. Uh, uh, during Fireballs, John Gruber uh, pulls it up. Gasset wrote, that he had a hard time believing that the $29 battery replacement uh, plan could have much of an impact on Apple's numbers. But he obviously never went to an Apple retail store where they had those lineups for battery <laughs> yeah. replacement. Dur apparently, those um, places were clogged like, Mark, all year. Mark Gurman at Bloomberg had uh, private notes from an all hands meeting on January 3rd. You know, those are, you know, not public. But at that meeting, apparently, Tim Cook said Apple replaced 11 million batteries <laughs> under the $29 replacement program, which was... I think was, Gurman had that they had a meeting and Gruber had the number that they discussed. Gruber the has the number. Oh. Yeah. Oh, good good on you, John. Little birdies. Mm -hmm. Little birdies. <laughs> Little birdies. So that's about 10 million more, 10, 9 or 10 million more than they would have normally uh, done. Yeah. And and so really what the question is not, is just, did fewer people upgrade to the I, the newer iPhones because their old iPhone worked great? And Purely anecdotally, I mentioned this before, my mom, I kept saying, come on, mom, I'll give you a 10R. I've got one here. I'll give you a 10S Max, whatever you want. And she said, no, my beloved iPhone 6 is better than ever. I got the battery replacement. <laughs> I mean, if you go back to the 2018 Q1 conference call, Tony Sakanagi asked Tim Cook if he was at all worried that the battery replacement would affect upgrades. And Tim said, it never entered our minds. We, that's the last thing we think about. We want to do what's best for our customer. Uh, and I have no idea. Ask me next year. So now, obviously, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, it year did. has come. So. <laughs> and and Gasset points out that regardless, uh, they, they, they should have known about this they must have known about this for months not just the battery but the no, drop because in sales people, in china they didn't have new iphones for months like it, it, very few people like when you look at the iphone release it's like a blockbuster movie it's not that you know the same amount of people buy it in january who buy it in february who buy it in march there's a huge spike in september or whatever the release month is in october november for some of the more recent phones but it's a giant spike and you don't see that really affecting it but if people who got those battery replacements 11 million people if even a portion of those by the time it got to September said you know what exactly like your mom this iPhone 6 is working great maybe I'll wait till next year to get uh, a new iPhone then that spike okay. is no longer quite so spiky but the Chinese economy has been slowing down for a while they it would have been foolish for them to assume they're going to have the same results in China these this was as Gase points out and many others have an S generation phone and that's typically slower anyway um, it, is that still a thing do you think oh it's a thing of course, it's a thing. It, it's but, it's but, well, a moderate thing because some people wait for the S because they think it's going to be a better version of the phone. Because mm. like this this year, I thought was a nice deviation from that, where it didn't it didn't feel like hey, we took we took our top of the line flagship phone and made only an incremental uh, adjustment to the processor and the storage. It felt like we it felt like Apple was saying. The folks who really, really wanted an iPhone 10 last year but couldn't really stomach the price, we found a way to give you most of the features in slightly less build quality for a more affordable price. And to my mind, and at least to the people, uh, uh, what seems like the people I was talking to about this, that they almost saw it as a whole new product as opposed to like an S sort of You're thing. You're talking about the 10R. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, So I, but I think the 10S... Is not okay, significantly different than the ten, but I'm, I'm, and maybe I'm we it, we I'm, watch pretty closely to the average yeah. consumer. Eh, it's just the new. It's just the new phone. It looks know? the same to me. I don't know if there was a lot of pressure if you had a ten to go to the ten S. I gave my I, son my ten. He was very happy to have a ten. It's hard to think though what they would. I mean, the ten was so different. Like immediately expecting a phone as different the next year too. No, so you should. I'm not saying you should expect yeah. that. I'm just saying that that's typical of an S year. And yeah. that that Apple should have known that the 10s wasn't going to be gangbusters compared to the 10 any more than the 6s was gangbusters well, to the six. They were or. pretty clear that it was like they saw rat like they they expected this because they guided down heavily for this quarter. This quarter was already discounted uh, more than I think a lot of people. So what expected. surprised them? What was the big the surprise? amount of battery replacements affecting the upgrade cycle? But that was small. He said mostly. I think he said over 100 percent. Uh, which is a funny number until you actually dig into it. But over 100% was uh, a rapid uh, downturn in the Chinese China. market, far faster yeah. and more extreme than they expected.
And I, I think if you look at the notes that um, that Tim provided in his his statement, the, the 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 issue here is the Chinese economy. It's not an iPhone problem. And when Apple first, uh, when Tim first released those notes, he, uh, people jumped on on the iPhone problem. But if you look through all of the things that Apple was able to accomplish in the quarter. It, it becomes clear very quickly that if it wasn't for China and the economy uh, deceleration, there would have been no need for Apple to um, do a, a guidance change. Now, their quarter still wouldn't have been as good as, as what they would have hoped, but there would be no need for this guidance change. So to say that... Um, that the iPhone is failing or, you know, Apple has a huge iPhone problem, I, I think is is a bit over dramatic at this stage. Yes, they, the uh, upgrade cycles were affected by the, um, the battery replacements. And I'm not quite sure why Apple was so surprised with that, or at least as surprised as they seem to be. But um, you know, that could also be with a lot of users, it could be a comfort level. I've talked to a lot of people that are, are very weary of um, uh, Face ID and not having a home button and, you know, just different things. And if they have the chance to keep their phones by replacing a battery, then they're going to do that. And, you know, the, the economy, I think, of, uh, of a lot of countries right now are, you know, kind of up in the air, you know, the, the U.S.-Chinese battle and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's affecting a lot of people in, in the economy in a lot of different ways. So if somebody has a chance for $29 to, um, to, to keep their, their current phone, I think they're going to do that. Now... An economic problem in a country as big as China is going to take – it takes a while to go down. I mean Apple rode that wave up and right now they're riding that wave down. And right. they, they have no choice in the matter. It's an economic condition. But that will change again and the economy will start to rise and Apple will do that. And let's face it, if – if this economic problem came from Canada, Apple still wouldn't have had to warn, you know, because the Chinese thing would have Ouch, been good. Jim, if, if, <laughs> if, the, if the economic problem was in in, in Switzerland, or, you know, when they, they would not have to warn like they did now. This yeah. is it's also interesting an economic to, problem. Yeah. It's not an iPhone problem. It's also interesting to see now that we've heard from Samsung and we've heard from LG and we've heard from some of the right. Chinese manufacturers and their their results are in some cases not going to be any better. And I think in LG's yeah. case, way, way worse. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, and, everything. Go ahead. I'm sorry. To, go ahead. To, to be fair to the people that are, are saying that this is an iPhone problem, are there things that Apple uh, should and could do to affect upgrades in, in the coming quarters? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying that there isn't. I'm just saying that the the. Um, all the reporting saying that you know the iPhone is dead, I think they're wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, that's 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 a great headline. That's a great way to get people to click until they realize right. how many times they're clicking on that story today. That's a but you make I mean, you make an excellent point. The the uh, the twenty nine dollar battery upgrade was a great deal, but even paying full price right now, forty nine bucks is not prohibitively expensive to us uh, to do to perform a uh, an optional upgrade or excuse me a, a, an optional and available swap that can almost give new life to an old device and maybe the what left the, maybe one of the genies out of the bottle is people being aware that wait a minute all this time i could have just replaced a battery and been really happy with what i got and it's it's uh, I, I do think there are people who are wearying of uh, that they they're, they're used they they're starting to think of phones the same way they're thinking of their cars where yeah. unless they're on a lease program they're not used they're not they're, now it's like no this is the thing that i will keep using until uh it gets until it gets really really weather beaten and broken and i can't use it anymore uh in which case that's when i i shift it off to the kids and that's when i finally get a new phone even this idea of getting a new phone every two years because a contract expired i think is kind of dying um i, I do what i uh, I, I do wonder if 
Tim is going to try to spin this at the next keynote by saying, and last quarter, we, we sold over a third of a <laughs> billion dollars in batteries. Applause, 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 applause. <laughs> and please don't pay attention to this other graph. One of the things that's really interesting to me, though, is that, and Apple doesn't say this, but this is also partly a problem of their own making. Apple really wants to create premium phones. They, they yeah. don't want to operate on the low end. But in order to justify, or at least partially justify the price of those phones, they want to make sure they have an incredibly long, useful life. And they've had Lisa Jackson involved in that as well. So they have processor overhead, which is which is set to five years. So if you buy it now, that processor should still run five years worth of iOS well. The construction, it's built well. It should last well. They've done iOS 12 now, and they're apparently going to keep doing that so that the iOS continues to make these devices run well because they understand if people spend that much money, they want to keep it for five years. <laughs> and even if they don't, they want to hand it down or they want to resell it and get a really high resale value or they want to give it back to Apple where Apple can, Apple can sell it in emerging markets. And they want to like basically increase the overall value you get for your money. But that does mean that these phones stay on the market for far longer than phones probably did a few years ago. Yeah, five years compare, ago. Com compare this to Google, where uh, I'm still using a first generation Pixel phone. It's still running so well, particularly with all the software upgrades that are almost like hardware upgrades that I didn't buy the Pixel 3 that I thought I was going to be buying this year. Uh, but uh, Google has <laughs> Google basically has that has that crystal in the palm of every single phone, saying that after three years it goes to carousel. Uh, we will only promise <laughs> uh, we'll we'll only promise OS upgrades to our own Pixel products for three years time. After that, you're kind of wishful thinking and 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 being hopeful about things. Whereas with Apple, I've had phones that have run for four as Renee says four or five years, and I only and, and I only voluntarily bought a new one because. At this point, there's so much new hardware and so much of a new evolution in the CPU and what it can do that I'm actually now attracted to buy to spend seven or eight hundred dollars for a new phone. So that's well, Apple will almost um, until they take their eyes off the prize, they will always have that built-in advantage as a, hard, as a hardware maker. And let's remember that there are a lot of reasons to upgrade your phone too, not only because new technology comes out, but because uh, children get to a point where where they want a phone so <laughs> you know you it's true i mean people yeah. do upgrade <laughs> just so imagine instead of grabbing buying your phone jim <laughs> a new phone for for the kids you buy a new phone for yourself and hand yours down i mean there are all kinds of different reasons for yeah. for upgrading you know a, a broken screen um used to be though jim that it was you upgraded because there was an amazing new feature and that well, is I, that's less the case these but see, days. See, the, the problem these days is that the amazing new features and 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 everything else is coming with um, amazing new prices too. And well, and, and that we haven't mentioned that, but that's away. a big part. Or their software, and you get them on your old phone. I mean, that's the, that's yeah. the the beauty yeah. of the Google Pixel approach as well. I mean, like if you have, I have the Pixel two because my long story, my Pixel three never arrived. I'm salty about it, but you know, it's <laughs> it's getting so much stuff that I'm not really that complaining about it right I now. I hear a lot of people say yeah. that. There's a, and there's a and there's also the question of is there going to be a time where Apple will want to be more proactive about third party updates? Uh, so some of those some of the coolest YouTube videos I've seen that are iPhone related are people who like live in live in Shenzhen. And so if they want to buy so they, they can really buy every tool they need to do yeah. any sort mm -hmm. of repair or upgrade they want. And mm -hmm. e including I've got an iPhone six, I've just added wireless charging to it, or I've got an iPhone, uh, I've got an iPhone eight, I've just added a headphone jack to it. And those, those are kind of those are fun and ridiculous. But we've been talking about things like. Uh, I'm going to remove the. I'm going to remove the memory chip, reball it, uh, reball a higher capacity one, and basically turn a 16 gigabyte phone into a 128 gigabyte phone. And it's it's not it's not something that requires clean room sort of stuff. Essentially, this guy had to make like to make one week's worth of like occasional trips to the market on foot to buy. Oh, here, oh, I I can't get the I can't get get the get this uh, this board reballed correctly. So I go to a stall in a shop and buy like a template that will be that has the exact right pinouts for the exact model of phone. This is something that somebody in a strip mall could easily do, particularly after they've killed their first 20 and they're on their 50th or 60th. Is there going to be a time where the, my screen is fine? I think the CPU performance is fine. It runs all the software I want. I'm, I just wish I didn't get the, 60, the, the 32 gig model. I want 128 gigs. 
If I had the ability to spend $100 to get my phone refreshed with a memory upgrade and a battery upgrade uh, by a cowboy or cowgirl uh, who had who ordered the right uh, the right stuff from Alibaba, that's that's uh, that's interesting, isn't it? It's driven by the lack of uh, change in the platform, though. I and mean, this PC industry has kind of been through this as well, where you know Intel's processors really weren't getting that much faster, and there just wasn't that much demand. For new PCs, it really it really tumbled. Why they want I, Johnny Cerucci so badly, Leo? Yeah, but I and, and I mean <laughs> some of this is overcome by marketing. Uh, some of it is I bet eventually will be overcome, I'm sure, by innovation, and that's why Apple's looking so hard mm. at augmented reality. But it's kind of like I call it the saturationing. It's like we, we are the part yeah. of the PC era where everybody has it's everybody okay. everybody who wants a phone has a phone that they're pretty much happy with, and it's okay. Yeah. I think that yeah. that notion that you have to have the latest phone. Is I, I'm hoping is gone. I mean, that was a bad trend. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be I, like any industry where, like, there are people who buy the new Canon body whenever that new Canon body yeah, comes up because they love it so. <laughs> but yeah, but but that's what it becomes. Like, you your your constant adopters become a niche, and then your mainstream that's adopters right. pull out the dramatically increase the adoption cycle. And you and so what you do is you sell them AirPods and you sell them Apple and Music Apple and Apple Television subscriptions, and you do all sorts of other. Things. Apple yeah. probably has a larger share though of those. Uh, enthusiasts than any other manufacturer i would yeah. i would think and, and also well could could apple preempt this and create a new hardware channel by simply saying that after after a certain amount of years go by, well after after a phone is out of apple care by one way or another we will allow you to buy a 128 gig upgrade or 256 upgrade or a motherboard upgrade uh if if at some point if they see that the writing is kind of on the wall here that they, we see that we see where our profit our our hardware sales are flattening out if we can no longer make 40 percent markup on an 800 dollars phone maybe we can make 40 percent markup on a two hundred dollar board upgrade you know what's going to save apple the air power Just charger <laughs> <laughs> dum, dum, dum. finally coming according to a hong kong website charger lab uh, again this is from the supply chain a company called lux share precision which is a, a part of the wireless power consortium assembles airpods for apple and lightning to usb-c cables according to charger lab lux share is now making the Apple Air Power wireless charging pad. So my standard is that if it was on Weibo, it's got to be true. I mean, that's just how I handle all these things. Yeah, it's one yeah. of those one of those rumors. Daddy, Daddy just went out to get cigarettes, and he's going to be back any day now. He's just out <laughs> really? there. Really, you guys don't think we're going to see it? Come on. I, no, I, I but I mean, I will, no, so I will not believe it until I actually see it on a said, webs, on the Apple website. A couple of weeks ago, Smith said, Tratton Smith said he's heard yeah. that Apple may have solved the technical challenges. They that's that's the story. But the thing is, like. I, like Andy said, I, this is like a Gandalf thing for me. Expect it when you see it. Um, because we've had like the Swiss retail channel say that it was coming last December or January. And it's just, until this thing is actually in stores, anything could happen. We could find out that the white is discoloring. We could find out that it doesn't, it doesn't do, I'm just, this is a shut up and ship thing for me at yep. this point. You're skeptical. <laughs> and then anyway, we'd have to get new I'm not skeptical. It's just, I'm tired. Yeah. We'd have it's to a, get uh, yeah, new cases uh, for our AirPods with wireless charging built in. So that's going to yep. happen yep. first. The difference between being skeptical and simply saying, at this point, I'm not even going to comment on it. <laughs> My only comment is we do we do not comment on, on unreleased AirPod, on yes. unre unreleased AirPods. Files. Actually, I was surprised to see this. Tim Cook said the revenue for Apple's wearables, watches, and AirPods is 50% higher than the iPod yep. at its peak. <laughs> not just the iPod, you know, when it first started out. The iPod, this is, he's talking to uh, Mad Money's Jim Cramer. The iPod at its peak. That's stunning. Each, the watch and the AirPods have each generated between four to six times more sales than the iPod had generated in the same amount of time since its and launch. I believe Apple Watch by itself is also, I don't, it's not one and a half, but it's also higher than iPod, which is, it's so funny. A while ago, Neil Seibert put this thing up saying, everybody thinks the Apple Watch is a failure and the Echo is a huge success when Apple Watch is selling, I think it was 10 or 20x what what the because there's so much we're all dealing with imaginary numbers like apple doesn't disclose apple watch numbers amazon mm. doesn't disclose echo numbers so it's it's like all fantasy math but when you start looking at how much of these things are going out the door and how much of the percentage of the other category or now the new wearables category uh people like neil can start to piece these numbers together and t tim just gave them away uh, and it's yeah. it's a huge market but when you look at how big ipod was and then you look at how big apple like apple watch and ipod 
and I sorry, and AirPods have become, and those are all dependent on iPhone. You start to understand why all this decade of building up iPhone as a platform has kind of set the stage for using iPhone as a platform to build up the next decade of products, the way iTunes and iPod built up iPhone. And that's one of my favorite aspects of Apple is that they're one of these companies that never mistakes their product for their business. Like Apple never became an iPod company the way that uh, Microsoft for a long time was a Windows company, you know, and they'll ride this into the last dime. Apple's like, okay, this, this is going down. We're going to get the iPhone up. Well, the iPhone is going down. We've got to make sure we have the AirPods, the Apple Watch, everything else prepped. Uh, and you start to see these in the results. And when you take away the iPhone distortion from this quarter, I think Cook said they're going to be up 19% on almost everything else, yeah. uh, which is super interesting. It's going to be the second biggest quarter in their history. I mean, it's still they're still going to get killed for it. It'll be the second biggest quarter in their history. Yeah. Can, it, can we can we also point out that that's how bad <laughs> that's how badly the the iPhone letter affected everything that Tim Cook is eagerly sharing numbers on the success of something yeah. that they didn't share numbers on with before. Jim Cramer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> of all people. Yeah, we were talking about privacy. DuckDuckGo just announced that they're going to use Apple yeah. Maps for uh, their yeah. maps for local searches on the Web. DuckDuckGo, of course, the, yes, the yes, privacy alternative to uh, Google search. That's absolutely consistent. They could have, they could have gone for a real open source uh, mapping solution. There were a couple of out there. OpenStreetMap is again, a good one, but it's not as good, yeah. frankly. As, it's not it's not as, as good, Maps. but sometimes partnerships like this are what makes right. are what what has to happen to make things even better. Yeah. So I'm that's that's a really really smart move. Again, the, the, that that's that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. That if DuckDuckGo is saying that this is what we are privacy 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 oriented, well, if that's the product you're selling, you really can't send people to a service like Google Maps that has an incredible amount of advantages. But one of the disadvantages is that Google is going to be collecting information to both enhance the map and also to enhance their advertising. Product. I guess DuckDuckGo was using OpenStreetMap, but uh, if you asked for directions, you got Bing. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just like it's, um, it, like open source is great, but you've got to spend so much money to go out. Like you literally have to have the trucks on every street the right. way Google did and the way Apple does now, and that's non-trivial for any company. Yeah, open, so open street going, map relies finding, on users to modify and update their maps. You have to fi finding entrances is an amazing yeah. amount of technology yeah. for places. You can't and you and the, the the amount of work that Google does just to figure out that yes, here is a street address, but we are you are not you're going to have to walk a half a mile if a car drops you off on this side of the block as opposed to this other side of the block uh, and I, I still and i still remember riding around with a member of the uh, wear map team uh, for nokia saying that we have to send someone out we have to physically send somebody out not an automated car we have to send somebody out to everything that we think is a hospital to make sure that a it is actually a hospital and also to that's pretty important map, yeah. and, and also to, and yep. also to locate where the emergency room entrance is specifically so that that is another under, underscoring how difficult maps is and that's what Apple is spending billions on for the new version of Apple Maps and, and, and driving all those streets and doing all that mapping. Um, and that's just hard to get any. You, you can crowdsource that, but you won't get the consistent pull through of data that you get when you actually drive it. Let's uh, take a little time out and then we're going to talk about Apple's next thing, which Tim Cook says mm, might be health. Uh, the episode you're watching of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by last pass we need last pass here at work we use it at last pass enterprise at home i use it steve gibson uses it that's a pretty strong recommendation yeah. from my point of view it is a password manager with trust no one encryption your dev your data is encrypted and decrypted only at the device level not even last pass can access anything in your vault zero knowledge it's also the most convenient the easiest to use it's just a great password vault and in your business, you know that your employees are not using the best practices when it comes to passwords. Just go down into the business office, see how many Post-it notes are on the monitor with the password to your 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 checking account on it. Or in the in the engineering office, there's probably a notebook somewhere with all the passwords to your website and 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 all your databases and so forth you need strong passwords you need passwords that aren't reused you need passwords that are stored securely and shared securely you need lastpass enterprise it makes password sharing convenient for employees it's got to be or they won't use it but it keeps access to your corporate data secure and you have complete admin oversight you could set master password requirements enable password resets Restrict access if an employee leaves. You can configure over 100 policies, access actionable security reports, create shared folders. We do that 
Oh, the ops team has their folder. The business team has their folder. That makes it very easy to get the password you need without actually seeing the password. That's another nice feature. So it turns out employees share passwords, not just with other employees, but with their friends and family. Keep those passwords secured. They don't need to know them. They just need to log in. I trust LastPass so much. We keep everything in there. Database logins, SSH keys, software licenses, business information. At home, I keep my passport, my driver's license, even my social security numbers are in LastPass. I know they're safe there, and they're easy to get to. When I travel, I've got my passport available, securely stored in LastPass. I think that's fantastic. And when it comes time to create a new password, LastPass's password generator makes it really easy to create unique, truly random passwords. They're not memorable, but don't worry. LastPass keeps track. You don't have to write it down. And the password autofill functionality now in iOS 12 uh, it's available in, in, uh, on Android as well, and Oreo, and later. Makes it so easy for employees to seamlessly use LastPass across their mobile devices. In fact, it's so easy, it's the first app I install when I get a new phone because it's going to let me log into all the other apps faster and easier. I don't have to copy and paste. It just fills them in. I just love it. If you want to turn on multi-factor authentication, and we do require that, by the way, uh, at uh, Twit, you have a variety of multi-factor tools, Duo, YubiKey, uh, and, of course, LastPass's own Authenticator app, which will send a push notification, not a text message, but a push notification. That's more secure uh, to your phone saying, approve, deny that login. The second factor is so important because, of course, even if your passwords are breached, second factor keeps bad guys from getting in. You don't want to be the next company on the big breach list. You need <laughs> LastPass. Here's another nice benefit. If you're an active uh, directory user, your company... They can use their uh, Microsoft AD credentials for a, a true single sign-on experience. LastPass, LastPass Teams for teams of 50 or fewer, LastPass Premium for personal use, LastPass Families for your family. That's what we use at home. And, of course, LastPass Enterprise. That's what we use here at work. Join the 43,000 businesses and the millions of users who trust LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. I, I wouldn't leave home without it. Find the best password solution for your team at lastpass.com slash twit. Lastpass.com slash twit. It is on everything you see here. My phones, my laptops, my desktops, everywhere. <laughs> Love the LastPass. So, Tim Cook says, Apple's greatest contribution to mankind will be coming in 2019, and it will be health-related. This is part of well, that they, Jim Cramer interview. I think aren't those? I think those are two separate things. Oh, I they're, they're separate. separate. Oh. I think that I, I think I think he said that in number one, we got we got new services coming up in 2019, and then our greatest thing for mankind is going to be health. Oh, okay. And I believe both. I believe both things. So, yes. so I shouldn't say there will be new health services in 2019. In fact, it's probably nope. a new video service, maybe a new news new, service. New Publish, new publishing stuff with the yeah. magazine company they bought uh, and the new video next service. Yeah. And you think next year we'll be seeing healthcare, uh, Renee? T texture. I think. It'll be constant. Like they they are really yeah. all in on health. And it's it was sort of serendipitous for them because, again, like they'll tell you the story that they only wanted an accurate calorie count for Apple Watch. And because of that, they made a heart rate monitor. And then they saw all the data they were getting off the heart rate monitor. And then Jeff Williams, who was running Watch at the time, got very interested in health. And they started doing research kit and care kit. And I think that's the sort of thing that they're going to incrementally grow as yeah. they see new opportunities. Like they've done healthcare records now. And they also have the Apple technology where you can you can use your watch as a badge and it starts to get really interesting like it can, you, it's easy to imagine one day you'll walk into a clinic you'll tap your apple watch and that will grant permission for that clinic to access your healthcare records and it'll be a private transaction that you have complete you know authority over and they'll know your entire history what medication you're on what that's health issues you have your previous thing really becomes a big deal yeah um, that, and that's, that's one it. of the things I think Apple really believes that they can leverage is that like they 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 originally they were absolutists about trust about uh, privacy but then they saw that with the healthcare industry they had people who for example because of their conditions couldn't keep track of their medication right. or couldn't actually report back what they were doing with the research studies so if you if they they created the ability for them to grant explicit permission for some of that information to be shared and they found out that when it was done. Like that old Steve Jobs things, ask him, ask him again, then ask him again. <laughs> tell, tell him in simple language, in plain language, and do it until they ask you to stop asking them. But once they implemented that, 
you're getting all these amazing studies onto things like multiple sclerosis, which we previously had multiple medications and they would have to guess which one to give you and postpartum depression and all these other other studies. And it's it's proving that Apple, if you are in a trusted position like Apple, you can start to do some pretty amazing things in the healthcare industry. Yeah, and these these people, uh, these studies that that Apple is doing, those people have said that they've never had uh, so many people sign up for the studies and want to be part of the studies, which helps the medical community. You know, they they get more information than what they've ever had before. They they get a wider variety of people signing up for these. So I I, I agree. I think that healthcare is going to be one of the biggest things that Apple ever does. Tim Cook said, yeah, uh, in this interview on healthcare in particular and your well being, this is an area that I believe if you zoom into the future and you look back and you ask the question, what was Apple's greatest contribution to mankind? It will be about health. Yeah, that's good. I, I that's I that's absolutely true. It is. I think that's the closest thing to Apple's historical mission to try to improve people's lives through technology. And you can't do a better improvement on someone's lives than preventing them from having an injury that changes the entire direction of their of their remaining days or reducing it to zero. I mean, even even the basis, the, the number of stories that we're getting back of uh People being able to point to data on their Apple Watch as a way of describing, hey, I, f I was climbing stairs and I suddenly just absolutely felt exhausted and that was not normal for me. That was three days ago. And here is a, here is my heart rate and here's a strip <laughs> from uh, for, that I took like when I was feeling that way. And every, if you do all the tests today, you're perfectly normal, but you can actually show here's the data that was collected, the time where I was feeling incredibly not right. And now you've been, you've suddenly been, you not, might not necessarily have had your life saved by that piece of data, but now you have more information on trying to figure out exactly why did you have to sit down after climbing a flight of stairs for the first time in, in, in two or three or four years. Um, I, I, I have to say that I'm wondering why Apple has not made the Apple Watch watch into a broader sort of product like they did with the iPhone like they did with the with the iPod and make it multi-platform because not only is it a huge amount of money that they can make off of all of these things but also the more data that comes in the the bigger benefit and the more people who have access to buying these things uh, the more uh, improvements of life they can do and finally wearables on almost every other platform is either non-ambitious meaning it's just sort of a fitness tracker that works well but it's just a fitness tracker or it's a total mess like like android wear where it could be the apple watch but they don't have the hardware they don't have the engineering they don't have the unified sort of idea of here's what we're going to be doing with the data that we're going to be tracking uh i still often wear my series zero watch even though i'm an android user because it's just like my it's just my favorite fitness watch ever I'm considering I think buying. Just, I'm buying a new one. I think they're just way like uh, it's sort of like it took until iOS five before I uh, iPhone was independent from iTunes and went to the iCloud. I think they're just waiting for the device to have the capabilities where it doesn't yeah. matter what platform you have. Instead of logging in with an Apple ID, you log in with a Google ID and you're fine regardless of what phone you have. It's just all your stuff. There's a they, 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 could, they could still do an Apple ID on on other platforms, but I, I, I I've, I've I don't. I'd be surprised if they if they don't have a target for it. I, I am. I will also say I'm surprised that you can't. You have to have an iPhone. You have. You can't set it up using an iPad or or a Mac. Uh, because if that were the case, I would have upgraded my Series Zero like two or three yeah. years ago. But why wouldn't you just want to get an iPhone, Andy? Come on, <laughs> get with the program. Yeah, see, it's not. It's not enough. I've. <laughs> how, you, I, I have. I have to have like a card in the mail saying, "Here's how many years of your life you will get back yeah. if you switch from the phone you like to a phone that is fine, but it's not for you." It's not just. Rennie, the, can, the, Rennie can send you one of those cards. <laughs> <laughs> can make one. Okay, but are they going to be good years, or are they going to be like the crap years from like '87 to '90? <laughs> where I have no rel living relatives left. I'm in a nursing home. And Where's my sugar Coke? Just we're give me my damn sugar Coke. We're focused on the uh, watch, but AirPods could also end up being a big thing. But this yeah. is In August of next year, uh, the, uh, the FDA's uh, funding uh, bill in 2017 included an interesting statement that there, the FDA would have to investigate by August 2020, would have to... Uh, introduce rules on over-the-counter hearing aids. Yeah. And already deal. we saw uh, Ergo at CES with a in-ear, much less expensive hearing aid that also did some... 
uh, you know, health tracking. Yeah, uh, rate, Starkey, which involved. makes the hearing aids I used to use. I'm now a Resound user, but the the, the uh, now has a Livio platform that does that as well. And Apple's perfectly situated to jump on that, the over-the-counter hearing aid market, and the the wearables or hearables, I guess you should call them. They'll be the new iPods, Leo. I mean, they'll they'll have health functionality akin to an Apple Watch and also be able to stream Apple Music. That's not that's that's not a long-term goal, I don't yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a very big opportunity. So it's the watch is just uh, the entry. The other question I have is is can you ascribe this really to Tim Cook? Uh, now I think Steve became very interested in health as he was dying, and I think Tim, as he's sitting there watching him yeah. pass away, also, and I think that he's even said this, became very aware of this. But this is really give Tim Cook credit, I think, for that one for saying maybe for privacy. Steve was big on that, but but, but, but absolutely for health. And Jeff Williams too. I mean, they, he'll just sit there and I mean, they they deeply believe in in privacy and health and all of these things. It's not it's not trendy for them. It's just part of the expression of what they believe their company should be used for. Yeah. Well, and you can tell that that Jeff has really taken up uh, the baton here for for health. Uh, and and when you hear him speak, uh, this is something that that he really believes in. So let's talk about Qualcomm. <laughs> the gift that just keeps on giving the last time we talked uh, apple had to stop selling its iphone 7 and 8 in germany well a german court has now thrown out qualcomm's patent case against apple uh just earlier today this is a big reversal for qualcomm the regional court in the city of Mannheim. that's that's the big uh, town where they make steamrollers right dismissed the qualcomm <laughs> suit as groundless Dad. Dad. Mom, dad, make those jokes again. <laughs> saying, saying the patent in question was not violated by the installation of its chips in Apple's smartphones. Apple said, we're happy with the decision. Qualcomm, <laughs> well, you know, Qualcomm's not happy. Apple has a history of infringing <laughs> our patents. Well, we disagree the conflation with, between licensing and chipsets within Qualcomm is it's is kind of well, weird. and I didn't know this, but I maybe I I, I learned this here, but uh, Qualcomm refused to sell Apple yeah. its chips for the latest generations of phones. I thought Apple was trying to get over, you know, move to Intel to get out of this, but in fact, it was they wanted to buy the Qualcomm chips and they couldn't. Well, that's part of the problem here. It's it's sort of like with the old Intel, uh, the Intel lawsuits where or the or the old Microsoft laws where in order to have one, you have to have the other, and then they will penalize you. If you don't go all in with them, and that's all of the information that's coming out, and I think that's why so many independent jurisdictions are also going after Qualcomm. Never mind the Apple lawsuit, like Federal Trade Commission and other commissions in other countries, is because they were doing that sort of bun. They were they were doing the things you do when you abuse uh, a position like bundling and uh, like they they could choose they could choose not to be part of standards. They could say we're doing our own proprietary thing. We think it's amazing. If you want to use it, we'll make sure that it works where it works. But they're like, no, we want everybody to use it. But now we want to charge you exorbitantly for it, and yeah. uh, especially in the EU and maybe in the US now, I don't, I don't think that's going to be tenable. It's, it's, it's hard. I've been, I've been trying to understand everything about this lawsuit, and it's this, this result of like this used to be a little bit browner here in my <laughs> sideburns, and that's, that's this little patch of gray, and I really don't, I really don't know how I feel about it. The Qualcomm, for their part, they make a pretty good argument, at least for the FTC case, which is saying, so what, so what have we done to abuse consumers? Phones have never been cheaper. Uh, they, the, the consumers are not paying a price for whatever you think is going on uh there is an alternative to qualcomm we are and it, as a counter to the so I'm, I'm wondering how at least in the united states the ftc uh, action is going to play out because there there are great cases to be made on both sides of qualcomm simply trying to make money off of something that they've doing they've been doing extremely well and navigating a business also extremely well versus the other stuff that they've been doing which is like it doesn't seem as though they they they're doing the right thing by double dipping uh, as renee says so i'm this is i'm almost at the state where i'm 
just going to wait to see who's still alive no, but in two that, years. That's then, what makes it so interesting is that like absolutely like Qualcomm is you get every dollar you can, but there is a point where your short your short term gain comes at the expense of your long term uh, viability. Yeah. And again, I use the Microsoft example where they rode Windows so hard that it caused them to ignore other potentials that could have you know like lots of stuff I wanted to see on the market. And Qualcomm first they have that licensing that patent arm which is so important to them, but that comes a little bit at the expense of their chipset business and they. They, they want people to pay based on the price of the device because they believe their component is so important that it's worth more than just the component itself. But you you can't scale that. Like if suddenly the the uh, phones are cameras now, the people buy phones because of the cameras. We make the sensor. We deserve part of the entire phone price. Oh, but you know the chipset. You know, we're making these pro. We're we're fabbing these processors for you. People buy because of the chipset. So now we want a part of the. There's only so many parts of that phone that you can divvy up. Uh, and I think Qualcomm would have an amazingly robust business and would have an amazing growth curve if they're like, okay, you pay us for the chip and license these products, and you know, right. everyone shakes hands and goes home afterwards. It's you know, yeah, it's 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 hard to say. Uh, you could also to play, and I'm I'm explicitly playing devil's advocate here as opposed to asserting a point of view that I I hold dear to myself. There is you could make a devil's advocate could make a, a, a comparison to. Uh, Apple's defense of their iPhone business that yes they have so many other businesses but really if the iPhone were to go away magically tomorrow they would be screwed with a double K in the in the word screwed uh, nonetheless Qualcomm is in a lot of other businesses they make CPUs they make Wi-Fi chips make Bluetooth Bluetooth chips mobile processors game processors but the the line share of their money comes from cellular modems because again this is what they built their business around uh, so. Uh, it's it's hard. I, I don't understand the business enough to have a really good opinion on who's absolutely right and who's absolutely wrong here. Uh, I hope it doesn't come to a point where uh, users' experience will suffer because the thing is we really like Qualcomm chips in our modems. They really work extremely well, especially if you travel, especially if you're in parts of the world where there isn't, uh, there there aren't really, really great unified uh, cellular networks and you have to keep buying coverage as you go. So Again, I'm, yeah, keep, I'm just continuing like to read about this. Company, I don't know what it would feel. It, may, it just feels like the one company you don't want to encourage to make their own chips is Apple, just given their history yeah. of making their own chips. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. That's that's something you don't want to do. And and you know, to Andy's point, you know, who's who's expressly right and who's expressly wrong? I think in situations like this, there isn't one company that's completely right and one that's completely wrong. But <clears throat> You know, I know that uh, Rene said jokingly and not jokingly, you don't <laughs> want to encourage Apple to start making its own chips. Um, Good news. You know, you, we've created a whole new network that's so yeah. better than any standard we could have well, possibly. No, but I mean, other, like, other just, com- just to make it personal. Other companies have done that and have lost. <laughs> so uh, to make it personal for a minute, I had to pay. I had to pay the qual. I had to pay the Qualcomm tax on my iPhone, even though there hasn't been CDMA anywhere in Canada for I think a decade now, just because they demand that regardless of where you are. And I could have paid, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, conceivably less for my phone because I would have just had a, a regular GSM modem, like, you know, like. A small, small country off in the top of your hat. <laughs> the, uh, the uh, according to uh, Jeff Williams, it's seven dollars and fifty cents uh, per phone. That's well, I guess I've, that's a I've, lot. I've, I think well, I think some of the companies that are suing uh, organizations that are suing Qualcomm have said it's as high as twenty, but that's another area that I can't really find out where the actual number the, is. The chips and the license, I think you have oh, to right. add them both together to get the. Yeah. So you have to buy the, the Qualcomm chips, dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And the license that and goes the with license. them, because you don't yeah. get the license with the chips, as far as I remember. It would be nice if the license came with the chips. And you're saying <laughs> that in order to make an iPhone, even if you don't need the CDMA architecture, you need to license that. Well, because yeah. Qualcomm, they were doing these world phones for a while that you could use on Verizon Plus all the way around right. the world. And no, because Qualcomm modems are so good, people want them. But their Qualcomm won't make one that doesn't include CDMA, because that's their bread and butter. I mean, it's just, it's... Although it's, it's it's licensing all the, the way down, but Qualcomm does have uh, uh, 5G patents as well. Yeah, rinse and repeat, Leo. So they're not they're not yeah. you know they're, uh, it's not it's not just the outdated stuff. It's it's it's. Yeah. Uh, they have LTE the, patents. They have 5G patents. Yeah, yeah. The, the other the other aspect that confuses me is that uh, in some regions they are. Uh, 
in some in some re regions they're required to cover a minimum number of bands that might include CDMA but might not, uh, and they might have and Qualcomm's position might be that we really don't want to create a whole other chipset just to take care of this one part of the world in which CDMA doesn't exist and we don't have to pay and we don't have to pay for it. We feel as though <laughs> the 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 amount of sales we're going to lose by charging extra for a license, people are uh, a manufacturer is going to lose uh, is less than the amount of money we'd have to spend to have a new fab or to have an alternative flavor of this chip. So again, I I, <laughs> I have to I have to get very zen and say I do not even know what I do not know. It's, I'm just so happy that AT and T's 5G is not affected by Qualcomm 5G <laughs> because thank, it's not 5G. <laughs> that, 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 sti that sticker works. That's just you just put a <laughs> e on that it. Sticker off. You put it. Did on you the, see the T-Mobile response where T-Mobile said BRB and they put a post-it note with 9G on top? Of it. <laughs> this is this is. I think I think they're hiring Nigel Tufnell as their spokesperson. Like, well, when you've got 4G, then it's not not fast enough. Not fast enough. Where'd you go from there? We've got 5G. Well, wh why don't you just have 4G and just make that a little bit faster and make that the highest speed? So the iPhone um, uh, 10s, 10s Max, and 10R only have Intel 4G chips in it. Yeah. Uh, what Williams said in his testimony on Monday is, uh, we were gonna because we wanted 5G. You know, every major Android vendor in the U.S. has a 5G phone. Uh, Intel's 5G modem isn't it expected to hit phones until 2020. Williams said the strategy was to dual source in 2018 as well. We were working toward doing that with Qualcomm, but in the end, they would not support us or sell us chips. He said That's what he they did last year. Yeah. He so said you, if you were on Verizon, you got the Qualcomm. If you were on everywhere else, you got the Intel. Yeah. And of course, uh, Apple famously slowed down the Qualcomm so it would be as dumb as the Intel. <laughs> uh, he said he contacted Qualcomm CEO to get him to sell chips to Apple when Qualcomm refused. Apple had to call Intel's CEO, ask him to supply all the modems needed for the iPhone instead of only half the volume. He had to scramble, Williams said. We would have loved to have continued access to Qualcomm tech. So it's not that Apple doesn't want Qualcomm. They do. Nope. Yeah. They just yep. don't want to pay them. Again, it's, it's the gold standard. They don't standard. want to pay them as You're much as they're being asked, yeah. 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 All the all your prop. If you have a Qualcomm modem, all your problems are solved. You do not have to worry about anything in terms of compatibility and connectivity and speed. Well, That's I don't want to pay Apple a thousand dollars for an iPhone. So there, <laughs> yeah. sell but, it to but, me for less. You know that's what it costs. Like so this is this, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, you can I, buy I an, I, a different phone. Yeah, and 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 also the uh, from to Apple's uh, Apple's uh, defense is sort of like that would be like if they're saying yes, you can buy an iPhone, but you all, we're marking up one hundred and twenty dollars because we're also selling you a pair of AirPods and you can't buy it without AirPods. But I don't want AirPods. Well, it's too bad you're getting it anyway. That's the that's the argument about how Qualcomm is abusing the markets. But that's and they're also that, that's selling it to you like imagine this, Leo. It's like not that you don't want to buy an iPhone; it's that you don't want to pay a percentage of your gross revenue for the price of the iPhone. <laughs> okay, you just that's want to fair. Pay the same base price that everybody else pays. Right. right. It's it's maybe right. maybe maybe the better analogy is Ticketmaster. It's like why am I why am I being charged an extra thirty dollars for this eighty dollar ticket? Because usually you say because <laughs> why? Well, service the fee. Because. <laughs> exactly. It's a service fee. Apple's going to start selling the HomePod in China uh, soon. That'll be an interesting. Uh, Just should Janda. Yeah, it's wonderful. January Siri will start disappointing users in a whole other language. <laughs> oh, they've been doing that on iPhone for years. <laughs> <laughs> I is it so? Every time I say "Hey, you know who?" in my kitchen, I mean I'm 15 feet away from my HomePod. I'm sitting, uh, you know, distantly. I'm right next to my phone, but the HomePod takes over every single time. Is that? Is that supposed to happen? Well, it's it, it's a it, the, it's yeah, sorry, Jim. Go ahead. The the way that it works is if if your uh, device, whatever device you want, your phone or your watch is active, then that will um, uh, answer. But the HomePod's that, always that, active. That, that hey thing. It's not playing uh, anything. But, it's just but it's always active compared to it's an just iPhone. Listening to you, Leo. But uh, all of those <laughs> devices judging. communicate. Uh, among themselves and say, okay, who's going to take this? Right. And if nothing is being used, like you don't lift your, your watch to, uh, uh, to your mouth or you don't lift your iPhone and make it active, then the home pod will be the one to answer the call. Oh. So what I should do is I should shake my phone before I say, Hey, Shlomo. Hey, Shlomo. Or, 
or hit it, hit it with a hammer. That that always works. <laughs> hey, you you blow, blow into it like a Nintendo cartridge. That works for me. Must be crazy. I do have to thank the NFL because whatever that you know that during all the NFL games. They say, hey, Shlomo, give me the scores or something. <laughs> Drives me nuts because my HomePod always hears it and always launches yeah. into a 15-minute tirade. Uh, they they changed. Is this your experience too, Jim? They changed something this weekend. I, it, it stopped activating it. Um, I the, the mm -hmm. During the college football games oh, and everything that was going on, watching the it was playoffs. driving me crazy. Oh, they, oh it was, yeah. I do. Yeah, I do know with other systems they've they've Amazon uh, does with, that. They they fuss well, it. Well, what they well what they actually do is they have a, their servers have a way of telling that all of a sudden everybody is is active is asking for Alyosha to do something at the same time. We're gonna guess that this is a commercial or this is a radio thing that's happened, so we're gonna basically ignore that. And if it, if it was a legitimate request, the per, the person's just gonna ask it again, and, and no harm, no foul. Okay. But yeah, I, I had oh, to, uh, but but th but they are doing something. I had a uh, my Google Home Max is right above like my bedroom TV, and so I was as part of research. I was in bed until 11 a.m. Uh, watching <laughs> watching some watching some like Google corporate videos in which the, the the latest ad, which is just hey hey Guillermo hey Guillermo do this hey Guillermo do this, and it it was lighting up but not responding. So it's not just that because not everyone was watching that ad at the same time. So, okay, now, wait a minute. You got Guillermo, you got Shlomo, and you got Alyosha. Yes. What do you call Cortana? I don't call no, it Cortana for dinner. because <laughs> we, could, we could say Cor it's, 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 it's the one name that's not. We could say Cortana, Cortana, Cortana. Nothing happens. Not because, Nothing happens. Yes. Oh, Leo, the iPhone, the new iPhone battery cases just went live. Oh, <laughs> is that uh i didn't even know there were gonna iPhone be new iPhone. 10s 10s max and 10s These are the, the hump cases yep the hump cases huh should we talk amongst ourselves uh, <laughs> i don't know i don't well, buy these order them. i don't like them i think they look funky so they do, but they have good they have good uh characteristics so be under yes. iphone accessories what are the good characteristics they, uh, instead of, so what a lot of battery cases do is they get in the way of the signal. So the radio has to ramp up and oh, it spends yeah, more bad. power while you're trying to charge it. These get out of the way and they have antenna amplifiers. Oh. They also, a lot of battery cases put the iPhone in plugged in mode, which, which spirals up all the networking and all the updating. These keep iPhone in mobile mode. So it's not expending all the extra energy. So again, you're not, you're not expending energy as fast as you're charging it. Yeah, well, I've had, so I've had very, this must be a Canadian thing. Cause I don't see it on my, <laughs> my. If you for the first time ever, Canada gets it first. <laughs> well, just just well. No, they're the up. I just harvest. clicked on the link. I'll throw the link in the show notes. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that 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 saves you money. The number of times I've had like an iPhone in a battery sled, and it's thought, oh, I'm connected to power. Now I can do all of the up, all the photo and video uploads that I'm not supposed to do uh, until I'm connected to actual wall power. It's like, no, I'm still on cellular. I just bought uh, four. Not one, not two, but four Aki uh, Type C uh, power banks. They're very thin, and they don't affect anything because you just plug the phone into them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have four of them because, uh, well, Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That, yeah. they're, they're nice though because they're they're power delivery, so it's over Type C, so they're very they charge very quickly. They're nice. We we def we've definitely crossed over a certain mountain recently because this was the year that I start I've started replacing all of like the old power bricks and old power char battery chargers that I keep in one in every single computer bag of mine with USB C ones because now I've got enough USB C stuff that it makes sense for me to plug directly into a USB C type charger or uh, a USB C charger that can charge an entire laptop. Uh, whereas before it was like eh, as long as I can charge a phone I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we can take a little tiny time out and come back if you will prepare your picks. We will be doing that next. But first, a word from Atlassian. We love Atlassian here. We're in an Atlassian shop. And I think if you talk to developers, uh, IT professionals, and you say, are you an Atlassian shop? They're gonna, they'll certainly know what you're talking about. And most of them will say, oh, but we wouldn't be anything else. Atlassian creates collaboration software that empowers teams around the world. It is, you know, a high-stakes business, keeping track of your ops 
And having the right tools can make your job a lot easier and make you a lot more effective. Of course, everybody knows Atlassian's Jira, which is a great way to plan, track, and support software. It's agile. Uh, Bitbucket is a great one for keeping track of your code base, if you've got a code base. We use Confluence for documentation all the time. In fact, last time I did an ad, somebody in the chat room said, I'm in Confluence right now writing docs. Nobody wants to write docs, right? But you need to have documentation for your setup, for how things work. At least, if you're going to do it, do it in a way that makes people want to do it. Confluence. Not just for developers. Atlassian offers an affordable, reliable suite of tools for teams of all sizes in all areas, from DevOps to Agile, from IT apps to Ops to IT, SM, and whatever is next. And you can see there's a whole lot more going on in there. Atlassian provides a technology backbone to help modern IT organizations plan, service, and support the kind of change that propels the business. Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, that's the backbone of an effective cross-team project planning organization and communication. And then you've got Jira Ops and Ops Genie and Status Page. That, uh, that really helps teams better detect incidents, alert response teams, coordinate response efforts, your teams can choose the tools that are right for your current framework, but trusting that as you grow, they will grow with you. And it all integrates seamlessly with Jira and Confluence. So your team can get the job done. Look at all the big companies that rely on Atlassian. 125,000 companies worldwide. We're proud to be an Atlassian shop. Find out more. Like all of the tools at Atlassian, they're easy and free to try. Just head to Atlassian.com to find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team and then let it grow with you. Try Atlassian today and unleash your team's potential. We're big fans. A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N, Atlassian.com. Pick of the week time. I like it. Jim Dalrymple usually has a great rock and roll pick for us. What do you have today, Jim? So... <clears throat> I have uh, a band, and I believe I mentioned them very early on when I started doing this show with you, but I'm going to mention them again. It's called, uh, they are called, uh, A Pale Horse Named Death. Oh, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> this, this, is, uh, this is a metal band, but they're a rock band, too. And they're coming out with a new album. Uh, there are three songs out right now on Apple Music. And the album is coming out on the 18th of January. So I thought it was good timing since you invited me back that I would bring a brand new album to the listeners. Yay. Now, this uh, this band is founded by the drummer of Typo Negative. And a uh, very, very good band. If you just like good rock, but it's, some of it is slowed down a little more. So it's not really... Uh, it is metal and it's not. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is just good, good rock music. So uh, there you go. You know, I, I, it makes me so sad that none of the current pop charts are rock. Rock is really kind of disappearing from the American music scene. And it is the American, in my opinion, it is the American music scene. Yeah, uh, and so I'm glad to glad to see rock is not dead, and that people. Yeah, are this, it alive. they they are a really really good band, um, and you know some of their songs tell about uh, like the the journey of being a rock star and things like that. Some of them are funny, and you know some of them are are very truthful about um, uh, drug addiction and and things like that, and uh, you know uh, it's not just thrashing around on on instruments there's there's some some sad stories in there too yeah in the great tradition of rock and roll <laughs> yes sir all right good pick a pale horse named death rock out andy and echo your pick of the week uh, I'm, I'm, if you're into schadenfreude, this is a great week to be subscribers to Netflix and Hulu because two competing documentaries about the fire festival and the debacle that ensued. F-Y-R-E. Oh, F-I-F-Y-R-E. 
F-Y-R-E. Uh, Hulu's documentary surprise dropped like four days uh, last night, uh, four days before Netflix's documentary is uh, dropping on Friday. Uh, I ha I was I only found out about it at like midnight. And of course, I was up another two hours watching it. Uh, and it was a terrific documentary. You, you'd, your, your, your lowest hopes would have been that it's just, hey, look, here's some stuff we got off of Instagram of people having a bad time. And hey, look, here's another shot of that cheese sandwich that you saw on Instagram a while ago. Uh, it's it's a very very thoughtful documentary about the process of social media influencers and how a crap storm like this can happen. Not only because of how easy it is to promise a group of people something that can't possibly be delivered by hooking into their dreams and aspirations, uh, but also how there is this still this tech bro sort of culture that says that so long as you know I'm wearing my sunglasses and a backwards baseball cap, I can raise millions and millions of dollars for an event that everybody is telling me can't possibly work, uh, no matter how many lies that I tell. Uh, it's it's more of a business documentary. I don't want to I don't want to downplay it that way. But you will learn a lot more than not just the fire festival. You'll kind of learn about how the next fire festival is going is definitely going to happen. Uh, the uh, I haven't seen the the Netflix one, uh, but this one has is done by was. Uh, produced by a couple of the social media promotional team members that actually promoted the festival, which means that A, they have access to a whole bunch of video and information that maybe the other producers didn't have. And also it's being told by producers who have some skin in the game of trying not to look like idiots. Uh, part, part of what I really enjoyed about the Hulu documentary is that you really do have different levels. They were talking to social media influencers who – I'm still absolutely puzzled by, but you're also talking to reporters who are covering this event and covering the broader stories around it, and also people who are in mainstream advertising who rely on uh, who rely on this sort of an outlet, who are giving a very very sober sort of discussion, even as they are very they're they're in business interview mode. They're in nice little out nice little professional suits on a neutral backdrop, being shot in high definition and being being forced to talk soberly and seriously about. Out, like a media organization called F Jerry <laughs> and like, like they're talking about Raytheon or, or, or Halliburton, which is also the biggest laugh that I think I'll get all week long. But I, I really, I really enjoyed the Hulu documentary. I think it was called fire, uh, fire fraud. Uh, and I, uh, I really heartily recommend it. And I'm definitely going to be tuning in for the Netflix one. Nice. Reminds me of the world record egg. Did you see oh, this on Instagram? Leo. <laughs> oh, God. I saw people making videos about it, trying to get in on it. This is the most liked image in history on Instagram, the world record egg. It's just a picture of an egg. 42,792,968 likes. And uh, the reason it's doing so well is because they're trying to beat the current world record held by Kylie Jenner. Boy, did they That's beat it. That's a very 2019 thing. We're 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 liking this thing not because we like the egg, but to show our dislike <laughs> for an actual human being. Yeah, that's really what it's all about. Yep. Is how much we hate the the Kardashians right there. That's so empty. <laughs> uh, Renee, that's not my pick, by the way. Renee Richie, your pick of the week. I just couldn't help uh, thinking would, of the fire I would, festival. I, I was egg. just engaged in a, in a in a hot Twitter debate, Leo, about how I'm going to be using this new iPhone 10R smart battery case for Pokemon Go Fest because oh. an iPhone 10R plus this battery case might just give Ooh. me actual eight hours of. You're, when is you're, Pokemon you're, Fest? You're, is it you're in you're Chicago? Literally, again? You're literally juicing. <laughs> I don't Sorry. know because they. I think they did Chicago last time because they wanted to prove they could do it after the dismal failure the year before. So maybe <laughs> your own fire festival. They should do go. it in Montreal. I think. Ah, oh, that would be, would that they're be doing nice? the first one in Brazil this month. So right. we'll see how that goes. Right. Um, so my pick of the week is, uh, this is one of the devices that Apple worked on um, for the HomeKit launch at CES. It's not out yet, but I really like it. I'm going to mess up the name. It's Netat Netatmo. Netatmo, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Netatmo. I like the okay, Netatmo. there we yeah, go. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank goodness for you, Leo. So what's so interesting about this is that it really is a privacy first doorbells. I'm going to call it a solution. It doesn't have any online component. If you, it come, you can put an SD card in it and record, I think, two days of video and it'll keep recording over it if you don't pull it out and download it or something. Or you can choose to hook it up to your personal Dropbox account if you want to, if oh, you want to have it online. That's a but good there's idea. nothing that goes up to any cloud that is not yours. 
Um, it's so it's it's designed to be quote unquote offline, you know, by design. But they also have a bunch of clever features in it. Like it's got an accelerometer. So if someone tries to um, do something to it, like pull it off the wall, it starts just taking flash photos of the person <laughs> so that you have <laughs> some record of who did it. It it does all these really cool sort of anti tampering things. Um, it, and it just I got a chance to talk to them, and it's just so uh, considerate, not just smart, but considerate. The way they put it together, because they did realize that people wanted cameras, but they, but they didn't necessarily want those cameras plugged into another company. So this is just you buy this, and that's the end of your relationship with Netatmo. It doesn't go any further than that. And if you want to buy another product, that's as far as that goes too. And I love like, and you might love Nest, you might love Ring, you might love all those companies, but I always think it's important to have these kinds of options on the market as well. Well, you know, we like those uh, Wise Cams for the same reason. They don't, um, you don't pay a subscription fee, which is a reason yeah. everybody can get behind. But also, the idea that you know your your videos aren't stored somewhere that you don't yeah. control. I think that's kind of this after the Ring debacle, and I I think this is I might replace my Ring with this. This looks really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The next, the next level is not having to. Uh, one level is is trusting a company like Apple. The other level is I don't have to trust another company. Right. I know for yeah. a fact that this has been this is not connected to anything else. That's yes. better. Yep. I'm I'm on I'm on the site right now and trying to figure out where to give them my money because <laughs> that's a great. Idea. <laughs> the, yeah, it doesn't look like you well, can. This wonderful it's... thing is like because uh, people will often say, "How do you trust? How do you trust?" I'm like, I do not trust any single company. I trust the technology behind AES encryption. Yeah, well, trust. That, 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 I can't that. trust. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. Well, I want to uh, counter uh, Jim's recommendation of rock and roll with a recommendation <laughs> Andy Andy will like. I just found a new uh, streaming music service that focuses on classical music. This has always been, for me, an issue. I love, you know, all kinds of music. But classical music, while it is on Apple Music and the in Spotify and everywhere else, often gets short shrift. And if you search for something, you're just as much going to find a a pop song is a classical song. So, the, and the other thing I like about this is you could, there are different subscription levels uh, depending on your bit rate. So the base bit rate is 320 kilobit uh, MP3, which is, which is uh, fine. And that's uh, fairly affordable, $8 a month or $80 a year. So it's a little bit less than Apple music. But if you want lossless 24 bit flack streaming and you've got the right devices for it, uh, fifteen dollars a month, one hundred fifty dollars a year. So, if you really care about audio quality and classical music, I think this is really interesting, and I've enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. They have a two-week free trial. I'm still deciding whether I'm going to uh, end up ponying up the money or not. But I just, I love the ability to just kind of yeah. stream quality classical music. I listen to it all the time, and um, I think yeah, this is an interesting play. Prime, you know the the, prob the problem of, of uh, classical cataloging is so bad that that's one of the main reasons why I switched from iTunes to Plex. The ability to simply say that, yes, <laughs> the, 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 the ability to say that uh, I, I'm interested in this recording of this opera because these two singers are singing on it. So please don't make me sort it by the orchestra and the conductor because I will never remember either of those things. Yeah. And please don't. And please, when it comes up on my phone. I want to know that this is the this is a, a the second act aria from uh, the title of the second act aria. I don't want to have to see Mozart com, colon the the adduction from the seraglio colon conductor colon orchestra, and I have to wait twelve seconds to find out what track I'm listening to. So yeah, that's that sounds like a really great idea. That, that's a problem that needs to be solved. This uh, it does support AirPlay if you're on an Apple device. Uh, it, they have a iO uh, Chrome. I'm sorry. Uh, Android version. I'm not, I haven't checked to see if it supports Chromecast. Now that the Chromecast audio is dead, well, who cares? But uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, I, it doesn't yet have a Sonos uh, a connection. Maybe it will. It's brand new, and uh, the software is uh, fairly new. And so I think. But so far, so good. I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, and I, I just often will have this on in the background. And they hit, what, one of the things I like is some of the playlists are really interesting. Uh, so. It's called Prime Phonic. It's at primephonic.com. And you can try it free for two weeks. And I just thought I'd mention that because you've got your rock and roll well represented. Now you've got your classical music. And now you've got Mac Break Weekly. Thank you, everybody. Jim, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much Yay. for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Love it's you, always Jim. Always good to be here. Loopinsight.com at Dalrymple. Anything you want to plug? Any podcasts or anything? 
No, I didn't. No, I'm good. I just, I just want to plug you. No, not like that. <laughs> Show title. He's going to plug Run, me. Leo. Oh, Run. no. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Always great to see you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Andy Anako, we know we catch you every week at WGBH Boston, Boston Public Radio, uh, and the material podcast all about Android on Relay.fm with uh, somebody named Florence Ion. She's The uh, lovely Florence Ion. Yeah. That is, she has so much wisdom and knowledge about Android and Google that she can actually do two shows a week about it, and I'm so glad to be doing that show with her. Fantastic. Anything else okay, you want to plug? Yeah, also, I've, I've fixed the database problems on my blog, and, <laughs> and so I'm now blogging again. So if you go to anotco.com, uh, you will see it updated more than once every four months, which was when I was able to do it when I was having database problems. We're going to move you to WordPress.com, and you wouldn't have these uh, I, I have I actually have established an account and a new URL on WordPress.com that is yeah. waiting for something, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to not having to you're doing You're doing WordPress, thing. but it's self-hosted. I have I have a self-hosted one. I also have a press a account on WordPress uh, dot com that is not active. That's active but not yeah. public yet. But and so I've I've been using it long enough to know that yes, it is much nicer than doing self-hosting. <laughs> oh, I because I self-hosted for a long time and I remember those database problems. And I don't want to ever look I'm, at that I'm, again. You know, I'm I'm glad it's it's like it's like that vacation to that place where you get some beautiful pictures, but you have to really abuse yourself to get that that place where you say that. I'm glad I that I've done. I'm, I'm glad that I've done self-hosting. I learned a lot of valuable yes, thing and has so. a lot of valuable experiences. I feel as though I'm a more experienced and wise person. Now I'm ready to never do that again. Yes, yes. <laughs> I I think I put that on the bus uh, bus ad. I will uh, with me like possible Andy 2.0 is my guess. <laughs> on the record, I H N A T K O dot yes. com. And I like the new look. It's very pretty. I'm work. I'm I'm working on it. I I love the new. Uh, the, I, knew, I love it's the a new nice WordPress. template. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, are you using Gutenberg yet to post? Yes. You like it? Which is which is a hoot and a half. I'm I'm tr I'm still getting used to it, uh, but I'm kind of liking it. I'm kind of liking how easy it is to make more structured and more interesting right. looking posts than the old one. A lot of power. I kind of yeah. I I kind of miss the ability to sort of like push the easy to, to me push the easy button saying yeah could you just give me the html code right now because i know exactly how to do the thing i right. want to do in html right. and i don't know how gutenberg wants me what kind of a block i need to insert in this thing to make it happen okay so yeah i uh, i mean i for and you know mars edit still works and mars edit's always a good way to post without uh, too yeah. much fuss. Where, where, wordpress is a hell of a yeah, system uh, there's a there's a, a new initiative by the way that's being backed by a whole bunch of people to uh, to create a new Word, wordpress platform that it's based on wordpress but also includes monetization that is designed for small newsrooms not necessarily for uh. one person blogger but but i'm talking about like local newspapers who have like as few as one and as many as a dozen people where it's not just the CMS, it's also the optimization, it's also monetization, it's also getting memberships in, it's also getting subscriptions in so that you can just hire to write the stuff and the business and we'll sort of like, sort of like a QuickBooks for running a, running a, a commercial uh, web operation. What's the name and, of that? Who's that? Oh, I just read about it this morning. It was on uh, the Neiman blog okay. uh, from, from Harvard. Uh, I should probably make it a pick of the week next week. I, I, my, my first thing is, can I do it just as a one person person who's not like a real newspaper? No. Okay. Huh. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's just another testimony to how versatile and how solid uh, WordPress is as a platform. If you're one person who just wants to post recipes, it, you got you, it's got you covered. If you are a newspaper supporting a community of a hundred thousand people, it's also got you covered. If you've, and if you're even uh, scale up 10 times or 20 times that it's also got you covered and it's not terribly, so long as you don't host it yourself, it's not hard to use. News Revenue Hub and it's Newspack, a uh, new feature on uh, WordPress.com. I will very definitely oh, check awesome. that out. Anything that, that, that empowers uh, journalism is I, you know, I, I really think we're starting to turn the corner now that we've got people who started off as whose careers as journalists started off in the Internet age. So they don't have to they can start a new business that's not based on classified ad revenue and on tire ads and on grocery ads that they're sure they're going to be getting every single day. 
we're starting to turn a corner where you've got that sort of awareness of here's how we can build this business. Here's how we can deliver news to the community, but also be able to pay people to do that because the quality of the journalism goes up when you can actually make people that uh, make people work full time on it instead of having to sort of squeeze it in. Uh, that's that's why on Instagram, that's why you, people are sort of fishing for, hey, give us a free hotel room and we'll blog about your about your thing. If you're making if they're making enough money that they can pay for their own damn hotel rooms and buy their own tech products. You're, you, you've got a certain level of uh, insulation. And now that we're seeing more sophisticated tools like this that say that we can not only, what we it's not just about publishing, it's also about the business ends of things. And we can integrate that into WordPress in a way that will essentially make the thing run with less supervision than you required before. I really think this is another indication that's turning the corner that maybe you will never be able to start a brand new newspaper <laughs> print publication again, but the people who really want to continue to deliver news to Worcester, Massachusetts, Lowell, Massachusetts, and even be an alternative to the Boston Globe, you can absolutely totally do that uh, with without having to mortgage three houses. Well, and credit to WordPress.com for doing this. That's yes. great. One of the reasons we love having them as a sponsor. No, Ren no paid promotion for me also. <laughs> Renee Ritchie. Is uh, of course at imore.com, and his Vector podcast is a much listened to. In fact, you you already got the Duck Duck Go story. I see. Yes, sir. Very, very good. Very good. We had three ads. We had three ads. He had time to write twelve hundred words and shoot a video. <laughs> uh, uh, anything else you want to give a plug to, Renee? No, I really like that video, the one that you see Georgia in the thumbnail, though, because I, I laid out some of the issues uh, pertaining to government regulation, but also the fundamental right uh, to remain private that I think we're all going to have to start discussing and grappling with. So that, that uh, was, if you have a chance yeah. to check it out, please Something let me know. Something we talked about uh, today, of course, yeah. I don't have an answer, but I'd love to be part of the discussion. Yeah, I think that's all anybody can say. You gotta, you gotta, We've got to be talking about this. And I do recommend that book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. It's on Audible yes. if you want. Uh, it's really... Um, it's long, but it's very uh, profound, I think. And she's a deep thinker. I don't know yet whether I agree or disagree, but I think it's a really important part of the conversation she's talking about. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. We do this show every Tuesday right after iOS today. So you can make it a double Apple day if you want, uh, starting at 9 a.m. with iOS today and then at 11 a.m. with MacBreak Weekly. That's Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Uh, you can watch it live at twit.tv slash live. If you do that, join the other folks watching live in our chat room, irc.twit.tv. You can go right there from uh, your browser. And uh, it's always fun in the chat room, 24-7, really. They're, they're constantly, <laughs> I don't know what they do for a living, but they're always, <laughs> the same people, always in there. Do you ever sleep? Do you ever sleep? Uh, you can also uh, watch on-demand shows uh, for everything we do. Uh, in this case, twit.tv slash mbw. Or subscribe. That'd be my preference in your favorite podcast application. Just uh, open it up and look for Mac Break Weekly. We've been around a while. I think you'll probably be able to find us pretty quickly. Uh, and don't forget your your voice assistants, Guillermo, Shlomo, and uh, Alyosha. In every case, you can just say, hey, Alyosha, or whatever. Uh, listen to Twit Live to listen to the live stream or uh, play uh, Mac Break Weekly podcast and you'll get the most recent uh, episode. That's an easy way to listen. There's got to be a way we can monetize those three names. There's got to be a t-shirt design <laughs> that will take advantage of this wonderful intellectual property that we've created here on Twit. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to make the show. That'd be the show name. So <laughs> <laughs> break we'll, time is we'll start. <laughs> hey, thanks, everybody. Get back to work now because break time, as the man said, is over. See you next time.